Well, good afternoon. Uh, honorable guests, um, Chair um, Mr. Huang and Andy from CPAC, uh, friends and all, good afternoon. Um, I'm joining you today uh, from uh, Calgary, Alberta, the traditional territory of Treaty 7 people and, um, and also Métis uh, uh, Region uh, 3. It is indeed my great pleasure to be here this afternoon, not only because CPAC uh, is presenting me with such an um, honor of the, this uh, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion uh, Award, but also this opportunity to join and reconnect with so many engaged, uh, concerned leaders, community members, friends and colleagues. Uh, some I have been working closely with over the past few years, especially the past nine months, uh, you know, with uh, Senator Pao Wu here, uh, and also uh, Judge Wong and Sandra, uh, Sandra uh, Young Rocco. And, um, and also because um, this, partic this space right here uh, is when uh, I, um, I came here when ACCT Foundation embarked on the leadership initiative in 2018. During my Toronto consultation, when I had the opportunity to meet then chair uh, Eric here uh, and, 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 and a few other people here. So the icing on this uh, layered cake is the opportunity to learn from Dr. Stanley and to make a connection with uh, Wendy here. Uh, and all of you here this afternoon. I wish to thank CPAC Institute and applaud the important and impactful work that you do. And as the chair of the Action Chinese Canadian um, uh, Together Foundation, and I'm joined here by uh, Judge Wong, who is also a board member of ACCT here. Uh, we appreciate working in collaboration with CPAC on various initiatives over the past few years. Andy asked I share a little about myself today uh, to talk about my work over the years and it's actually 45 years, not 25. <laughs> um, but thank you very kindly. Uh, but I'm a grandmother of three. And uh, so, um, uh, so I, I, I continue, and why is it that I continue to do this work and some of my experiences? Perhaps this sharing can serve as a case, a narrative on equity, diversity, and inclusion, or the struggle for EDI. So I recently prepared a reflection on my experience for publication that I think would serve to provide the context and narration of my journey thus far. So this is where I'm going to start. My gong gong, my, uh, my um, maternal grandfather, wrote a letter to my parents in the 60s, urging my parents to immigrate to Canada after my father's decades of failed attempts to reunite with my ye -ye, paternal grandparents in the United States, and, and then that's because my grandfather was a paper son. And, uh, and my grandparents were separated for 31 years because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I grew up without grandfathers. So, um, so my grandfather wrote to my, my father uh, uh, to uh, urge him to immigrate to Canada so that my siblings and I would have access to good education in a safe and secure environment. My grandfather's letter wrote, and I quote, Canada is heaven for children, purgatory for the middle-aged, and grave for the aged, end of quote. Our arrival to Calgary 51 years ago, this Monday, June the 11th, marked the first family reunion of my maternal family and the first meeting of my 41 years old father and my, my ye, ye my grandfather in his 60s. They met for the first time at the old Calgary airport when my father was 41 years old. So two family milestones since the first arrival of my great grandfathers to North America as laborers in the 1920s, my linkage to the Chinese Exclusion Act. My becoming a Canadian citizen connected me to Judge Sinclair, who introduced the concept of multiculturalism to my family. We were all struck when he told my family to retain our Chinese language and culture and become good citizens. This legislative framework that acknowledged multiculturalism as the fundamental characteristic of Canadian society, guided by the recognition of, quote, the rights of all individuals to preserve and share their cultural heritage while retaining 
the right to full and equitable participation in Canadian society, end of quote. The Act also speaks on the need to remove any barriers preventing full participation in society and promised to assist individuals in eliminating and overcoming discrimination. So the Multiculturalism Act is not about keeping the way we dance and eat, you know, but it is about removing barriers and addressing issues of discrimination. The policy emerged in 1988 in response to the changing racial and ethnic diversity with increasing number of immigrants coming from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And newcomers expressed concerns about employment, education, and discrimination. This act would play an integral role in shaping Canada's future as well as mine. The Visionary Multiculturalism Act trickled down into civil society in the 80s, igniting a new sense of hope and imagination for new possibilities to fulfill missions in enhancing equitable access, social justice, and inclusion amongst public servants, educators, health workers, uh, and uh, community builders, artists, police officers, private enterprises, and change makers. I came of age at the time of the Inspirational Multiculturalism Act and dedicated a large part of my life doing my part to realize that vision, which reflected larger shared sentiments amongst generations of Canadians, especially those Canada is their chosen land. While we have come to recognize various inaccuracies of this act, this in inspirational policy nonetheless propelled changes in school systems police and community services, primarily by inspired personnel in the front line. I was uh, engaged in inter intercultural dialogues with educators and parents, cross-cultural trainings with police, health workers, and institutions. Driven by the vision encompassed in the Multiculturalism Act, I started the Chinese Community Service Association, a weekend Chinese language school with a Canadian belief that heritage languages are valuable resources and connectors amongst generations and nations. I started the multiculturalism camp for youth with the aim to instill connections and pride in their heritage and activate multiculturalism on the ground. I entered into the helping profession of social work in part witnessing the lack of equitable support to linguistic and racial minority communities, including my own family. My social work education and practice would transform me from attending classes with the mental process of assimilation to cater to the dominant Euro-Canadian environment. So what am I gonna say today to earn my 20% so that the rest of the white people in my classroom would accept and understand, instead of speaking truly what I believe and what I was thinking and experiencing. So from that to being immersed in the struggle of those who are disproportionately disadvantaged by our systems, and in turn, the organizations I was leading and myself were unfairly treated by the systems and the institutions that did not live up to their stated emissions and the vision of an inclusive, multicultural Canada. The people who sought help from my organizations about their experiences of mistreatment, systemic neglect to their needs and, and, and issues, and inequitable access to opportunities and support became my issues and experience as a community builder and an advocate. I learned how community members never had the chance to air their concerns for the mistreatment by law enforcement. And I and others advocated for the people we were personally threatened. The two times that I feel scared in my 51 years of age, when was, um, I um, organized a petition about the Chinese community's concern about mistreatment by police. And I was visited by four deputy chiefs. And I was scared. Racialized communities are by and large excluded by major funders in social services sector. I spent a total of 15 years to overcome barriers from all levels of government and major funders. The inequitable access to public support is a result from existing systems continuing to function 
within structures and programs that only cater to about 70% of the population. But yet, we all pay tax. So I was told, Chinese should not be born here by youth in my multicultural youth camp, struggling with their identity development. I often encounter adult Chinese Canadians telling me that they mourn for the loss of their identity, their heritage, their, their language, and the traditional values and, 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 uh, and belief of their parents and grandparents. And they share that in my leadership programs. The experiences of second generation immigrants possessing a lower sense of belonging than their immigrant parents are later validated by research. I observe firsthand education systems that do not share the belief and value in the importance and benefit of heritage languages as fundamental to identity development with cognitive, social, and economic benefits. Education systems have the responsibility and opportunities to work with other actors in society to nurture and contribute to the development of confident and contributing citizens that fully actualize their aspirations and talents in authentic ways secured with a sense of belonging. I experienced the direct and indirect tactics to block community efforts to offer second language language programs. Federal and provincial governments from embracing multiculturalism with support to heritage language programs in the 80s, only $55 per student federally and 25 uh, provincially to a total elimination of support. My civic engagement reached the political spectrum when I became the first um, Asian Canadian woman elected to the school board in 1995. It was, a momentous, um, uh, it was momentous for the diverse communities that were so integral in making this historic milestone happen because I had the most multicultural campaign team. It was really, truly uh, a victory for all of them and all of us. So, um, so it was uh, momentous for the, for the community. And, um, um, but people see me with an institutional title and call it another immigrant uh, success story. My first month in, uh, as a trustee, I received a letter from someone who called me the yellow peril. And, um, uh, and a message from a student teacher uh, that, that she told me, Teresa, you have to work extra hard because the teachers and the parents in my school, they talk in the, in, in the, in the staff room that I don't represent them because of my racial background. A management per personnel of the school board um, questioned, when I started asking questions, then she actually responded with this question. Well, I don't know whether all the people who voted for you were Chinese. So when the Chinese bilingual program was passed uh, by the school board, fellow trustees stated, quote, they, the Chinese, are taking over and balkanizing the system. And racial slurs echoed in the background. The glaring and persistent underrepresentation of racialized groups in the public institutions during my time in public offices perpetuated the omission of the needs, perspectives, and life ex experiences of diverse communities throughout the system. The impacts of that exclusion and omission can be devastating, whether it is the huge disproportionate cut to English as a second language in 1992 that led to me running for school board trustee. The rest of the system was cut by 3%. English as a second language was cut by 50%. Why? Because we don't show up to meetings. So disproportionate support for families with children with disabilities. So Chinese families with children with dis uh, disability were getting less support than everybody else. Internationally trained professionals, omission in senior policy uh, studies, and potential sanction to exclusionary treatment uh, of diverse groups by changes to the Human Rights Code. So while living up to the vision of multiculturalism from the perspective of breaking barriers and achieving diversity in leadership and personally upholding the belief and intents of the act, the minority experience within the system most often are filled with added hurdles. Raising and addressing issues against the grains of establishments, silencing and isolation, and enduring insults and disrespects to marginalized groups, in, including one's own ethnicity and, uh, and community. 
Some would focus on being above the fray, staying above the fray as trailblazers. And some would question, are all the other, the underrepresented groups, women, indigenous, and all racialized Canadians and, Canadians and those with disabilities, are we just not, all of us, not good enough to be here? And deeply questioning whether the systems have been living up to their stated mission and vision. Whether, they, whether, whether it is under the banner of multiculturalism, welcoming and inclusive communities, or others. The experiment with the vastly embraced concept of multiculturalism and transformation as a pluralistic society fostered generations of pioneers within the full spectrum of civic engagement in Canada. Their journeys filled with new visions and hopes, ever evolving and, uh, and evoke states of triumph and purgatory. Movements of the truth and reconciliation with indigenous peoples, Black Lives Matters, anti-Islamophobia, resurgence of anti-Semitism, and anti-Asian racism in, East, in recent years resurfaced and magnified the need for, as well as examination and declaration uh, by institutions for systemic or institutional change as stated in our Multiculturalism Act 50 years ago. So I think Wendy talked about the need to, um, to walk the talk. And uh, so 50 years, 50 years in the making. This round of EDI is my third round. I started working with schools on EDI in the 1980s. I attended my first cross-cultural training with the police in 1986 when my son was two years old. Now he has three children, three children, making me a grandma. And we are now, if you remember two years ago, some of our systems were questioning whether there's truly systemic racism. So I continue to do what I do because I, along with many, many of the, you in this room, in our community, in our country, believe in the potential this country possesses uh, that this country possesses um, the potential that Canada possesses to reach our shared inspiration <coughs> for a fair and inclusive society. The current anti-Chinese, anti-Asian hate requires us to build on the insights, experiences, and resilience from those who have contributed to the building of Canada and this country's experiment of social change to us a more just and inclusive society. Through the ACT Foundation, as the Canina created the ACT to End Racism Network, which CPAC has been a core member since its inception. Thank you. These collective voice and collaborative efforts have created the foundation for building and working in alliances, which is integral in addressing racial equality issues. Community resources are developed and shared um, helping to build community capacity in more efficient manner. The Chinese Canadian community also needs to examine how we build on the experiences and resilience of those who came before us to organize and support informal and formal civic actions, public awareness and education, and institutional engagement and change. It is my view that we need to find ways to learn about ourselves and learn how we would work together to address or share challenges, uh, of con uh, our, our share challenges and concerns. We research and build into our leadership training program the model of mo uh, democratic practices, which I'm better now, which encompasses identifying or naming the issues. Um, you know, whether it's that we are feeling alienated. And uh, whether it's about, um, well, I think let's talk about things that we don't normally talk about, poverty amongst Chinese Canadians, especially in Toronto. And uh, the number of um, uh, Chinese Canadian uh, experience poverty actually is very high in Toronto. And uh, because of the, uh, the, mod the impact of the model minority myth and the internalization of model minority myth, we actually, we, we silence ourselves and we don't talk about those issues. We don't name those issues. So I think the, the beginning of the conversation is to name the issue. 
and, um, and then we have to frame the issue so that a range of actions can be considered. And, uh, and then we look at the pros and cons and the trade-offs uh, and uh, the, the evidence. And then we have to make decisions deliberately, which means weighing the trade-offs and, uh, and, and not to take hasty decisions. And then we have to identify the resources that, uh, uh, that, we, that are required and, and available, and um, including the intangible ones like enthusiasm and commitment. And then we also have to encourage collective learning so that we keep the actions going. And this is, um, in, a, in, a, in a way, a moment of coming full circle for me, because when I was in this room in 2018 to conduct the uh, consultation uh, for ACCT on the leadership program, a woman in the audience actually said, how can we learn to respect and work with each other when we are different and when we disagree? Which is the essence of democratic practice, because democratic practice a way citizens can work together, even when they disagree, to solve shared problems. As we commemorate the centenary of the Chinese Exclusion Act at the time of resurgence of anti-Chinese sentiment, we will draw from the strength and resilience of our predecessors. We will assert and name the issues when public policies and practices create disproportionate adverse impacts on us as a group, and when public entities disparage and our concerns and experiences with indifference, because that's what citizens do in a democratic society. We name the issues and we organize. This is an exercise of our citizenship, a struggle that have never stopped for 100 years. Despite the endless challenges and hurdles, we now have a generation of established Chinese Canadians and leaders positioned to assert ourselves for fair treatments and respect demand changes, and create opportunities for others, aspire to engage, serve, and lead, to achieve the promises of equity, diversity in leadership, and meaningful and full inclusion. So in closing, with your indulgence, I would like to share my um, renewed vision for Canada, expressed with my ongoing learning on reconciliation with you today. So, it is based on the indigenous um, teaching, uh, seventh generation teaching framework. I um, had the honor of um, announcing the, um, the June 23rd National Remembrance event chaired by Judge Wong with um, uh, Senator Wu here uh, in the government, um, what, was it, what was that room called? where we make the announcement? Press gallery. Press gallery. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know what? I did not feel a lot of love that day. And uh, usually I feel the warmth, you know? I lived 51 years in Canada. I started living in Calgary when Calgary only had 250,000 people. And everybody says hi to you. Everybody nods, you know? A very friendly environment. I did not feel a lot of love in that room that day. And um, so, um, so I, I, this, this, this new vision I put together um, have, have some special meaning to me in, in 2023. So um, based on the indigenous seven generation teaching, this is my, my new vision statement. Indigenous peoples and settlers, new and old, embark on a collective, collective journey towards an equitable and inclusive pluralistic society and honor respect, truth, embrace diversity with humility, gain wisdom from our dynamic evolving culture, uphold courage and honesty through passages of change, demonstrate compassion, respect, and love during times of tension and challenge. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to share my journey and experience and perspective, and thank you so very much for your very kind attention. Thank you.